Hi, welcome to this video on Introduction to Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy. So in this video, we're going to really um, discuss um, impedance spectroscopy, what impedance, spe impedance spectroscopy means in the world of electrochemistry, and how to visualize um, the data. So the nice thing about impedance spectroscopy is it does actually have a lot of um, applications. You know, it has applications in um, cells, batteries, modules. So obviously the fundamental unit in a um, battery is actually an electrochemical cell, an anode, a cathode, and an electrolyte between it. And those cells build up to be batteries and batteries get packed into modules. But um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy plays a very useful role in understanding batteries. We're also entering a kind of a green era, or rather we are in a green era. People are very interested in um, hydrogen and green hydrogen, and they see it as one of the sort of fuels and power sources um, for the present, present rather, and into the future. Um, so impedance spectroscopy can also be very useful in the development, um, manufacturing, and um, usage of fuel cells. Um, impedance spectroscopy also plays a role in um, coatings and corrosion. If you're looking for a trillion dollar problem in the world, then I would say take a look at corrosion. You know, corrosion unfortunately happens everywhere. It's part of um, sort of entropy and the fact that things want to oxidize and unfortunately break down. But corrosion and coating and the electrochemical processes can be understood using impedance spectroscopy. And then something that's very close to our heart at Zimmer and Peacock is sensing. Um, we in particular do biosensing, but sensing it could be gas sensing, it could be um, enzyme antibodies, um, ionophores, etc. But sensing is also something that could be well understood using um, impedance spectroscopy. And then in terms of a list of applications, there's also um, solar cells or, or photovoltaic um, cells. And this is just a way of producing obviously power and energy from um, the conversion of photons from something like the sun, obviously, um, into electrons, which um, you know, can power um, cars, batteries, etc. Um, so here we're just saying, you know, the reason that um, you should be interested in impedance spectroscopy is it's very useful in electrochemical applications, and electrochemical applications are very important um, to humanity in general. The video playing in the background is just um, one of our um, impedance spectrometers um, at ZP that allows us to use impedance spectroscopy in our research. Um, I'm not going to dwell on a on a, on this schematic of a lithium ion battery. Oh, sorry, a lithium ion battery here. But what we have is we have um, in a um, lithium um, ion battery is we have an anode. Um, on the opposite side from the anode is a cathode, and these are separated by an electrolyte. And in a um, lithium ion battery, there's a migration of ions across um, from the anode to the cathode during um, discharge and as these um, lithium ions migrate, electrons pass through the external circuit. Now the only reason I bring this up is because um, so much of what modern society relies upon, including lithium ion batteries, are electrochemical systems. And suddenly, electrochem and suddenly you start seeing that if electrochemical systems are so important to us and EIS or electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is so good at analyzing and understanding these systems, then you can understand that actually this is um, an important um, topic um, for discussion. Um, what does EIS do? EIS, for example, um, here we have a um, lithium ion battery, you know, which can be applied in cars, obviously in smart devices. Um, and what EIS or impedance spectroscopy allows us to do is to interrogate that electrochemical cell in a non-destructive um, manner and we can do it and we will explain this a bit um, we apply a potential the units are voltage and we do it in a sinusoidal manner now we will explain all this in a bit um, but we excite with sine waves which of voltage and we get a current response and it's that kind of relationship between the excitation and the current response um, that tells us about the um, electrochemical system under interrogation. In this case, it would be a lithium um, ion battery. And we can build models for it. You're not obliged to build these types of models. Um, if you have an electrochemistry background, which us, we at ZP do, we would build an equivalent circuit. But I realize in this modern day and age, you can interpret this data using all sorts of models and they don't have to be 
equivalent circuits and they don't have to be anchored in the physics and electrochemistry but equivalent circuits and I will describe these in a bit are a good way for us of modeling an electrochemical cell and then we can track the components in this model and say is this electrochemical cell um, behaving within boundaries or is it out of boundaries but I will discuss this in a bit and we can visualize um, these um, electrochemical equivalent circuits um, using things like um, the Nyquist plot but it's not just the Nyquist plot there's also something called the Bode plot so if I just stop for a second take a breath so electrochemistry obviously plays a lot of um, is a very important technology in a lot of um, tech that now supports modern society from batteries to capacitors to fuel cells to solar cells to biosensors and impedance spectroscopy is very useful because actually it can interrogate these electrochemical systems in a non-destructive manner and just by simply applying a sinusoidal um, change in voltage and looking at the current response we can understand the various we can build a model for that electrochemical system which we call an equivalent circuit we can visualize it using something like the Nyquist plot which is the last little cartoon here with all these sort of semicircles and we can start to understand the status of that um, particular system now an equivalent circuit if we have a real system like this um, lithium um, ion battery earlier on that's a reality but in order to understand that reality we can build a model of it and electrochemists have adopted um, really ideas from the electronics industry where um, rather than talking about anodes and cathodes and electrolytes and lithium ions we've reduced it down to capacitors and um, resistors and there's also other elements called phase um, constant phase elements and Warburg elements but these are just um, models but the model is very powerful because um, you don't really want to model the reality. The reality would involve um, sort of multi-physics um, programming and we can actually reduce it down to something that's quite um, elegant and just using um, off-the-shelf um, components otherwise found in the electronics industry. So this is a sort of mathematical model of the reality. But the model, the nice thing about using an equivalent circuit is it's, it's anchoring your understanding in reality. So this um, electrolyte resistance is the electrolyte resistance between the anode and cathode of this particular lithium ion battery. This charge transfer resistance, this is the resistance of electron transfer at that anode. This capacitance is the ability of that anode to temporarily um, store charge. So what's nice about an equivalent circuit, and I've just labeled it a Randall circuit here because this is a kind of classic in electrochemistry, is it's a model, but it's a model that is actually anchored in reality. It's trying to um, properly reflect what's going on in that electrochemical cell. I'm just going to talk very quickly about an application of impedance spectroscopy. So something that we at ZEP do a lot of is biosensing. So though I'm going to talk about biosensing, I don't want you to feel like um, we're this the rest of the video after that is not applicable to people interested in batteries and fuel cells. Um, it is. But at ZP, we a lot of what we do is um, we'll take something like a screen printed electrode. Um, we'll functionalize the surface. So we want to make the surface specific to a particular um, molecule. So we'll take that carbon surface. This is what we call our hypervalue um, screen printed electrode. And we will tether onto the surface um, what are called NHS groups. These are just active groups. And we tether them onto the surface using this pyrene linker. And then we can tether on antibodies on top of that. And then we block the surface um, with proteins to stop what's called non-specific binding. And we follow that process. So in fact, there's a potentiostat again in the background. It's the EMMA uh, multi-channel potentiostat. And we, we follow that um, functionalization of that surface using a technique called cyclic voltammetry. Today, we're not talking about cyclic voltammetry, but ZP and on the YouTube channel, we definitely have lots of videos about cyclic voltammetry. So as we start to modify the surface, the surface is effectively getting blocked and the cycle voltammetry becomes very distorted as opposed to something that's beautiful. If you want the definition of beautiful, it's probably worth seeing one of our other videos um, about that. Um, but I want to really get to this point, which is having functionalized our surface to be specific to a particular um, protein, let's say, um, 
what we will do is we will do a um, an experiment um, on that um, cell. I'll just back up slightly here. Um, so we'll do an experiment here where we'll just do the baseline um, where there's no binding and we will look at it in a Nyquist plot. Don't worry, I will talk about the Nyquist plot in a bit. But I'm sort of giving you a sense of what we do with it and then I'll try and explain all the maths behind you know, what is actually going on here. What are we seeing here? So we'll start off with a surface that has no binding to it. Then we will bring in the analyte of interest and the surface will change. Now what's happening is we're actually bringing in often materials that are quite, um, they're proteins, they're not conductive, they're insulating the surface and we end up increasing the resistance and the capacitance on the surface. And the Nyquist plot um, reflects it. Every time we get binding, this Nyquist plot um, changes the sort of diameter of this um, semicircle. Um, now I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of impedance spectroscopy. So I say that impedance spectroscopy is useful because it's a non-destructive way of understanding things like um, cells. Cells make batteries, batteries make modules, modules find their ways into cars. Very useful science. I just gave you an example of actually where we were binding to the surface. But as we bound to the surface, what we were doing was changing the resistance of that surface and the capacitance of that surface and the Nyquist plot was developing as that process took place. But what is actually, you know, what is impedance spectroscopy fundamentally doing? So impedance spectroscopy, um, really you could start off by thinking about Ohm's law. So Ohm's law is something that hopefully many of you will have studied um, in school, essentially. Um, and it's sort of Ohm's law says that the current that I measure is equal to the voltage that I apply and there's a ratio between the two of them and it's the resistance that determines that um, ratio. So for example, if I have a simple resistor and I change the voltage from uh, 10 volts to 20 volts and the current goes from 2 amps to 4 amps, what that says is that's a 5 ohm resistor. So if I have a very simple um, electrochemical system and it acts like a resistor, I can very quickly tell you what the resistance is just by changing the voltage and measuring the current. Now, impedance spectroscopy really is in it's is I want to say as simple as this, but literally what we are doing is we are changing voltage and measuring the current and telling you what the resistance. But I will start using the word impedance in a bit as well. So what we do in impedance spectroscopy is rather than just going from 10 volts to 20 volts, we're actually oscillating or changing the um, voltage periodically in a sinusoidal fashion um, and the amplitude that we would actually use is something like, more like it's not um, 10 volts we're actually using things like 5 millivolts 10 millivolts very small um, amplitudes and the current changes accordingly so in accordance with um, Ohm's law if the voltage changes, the current is essentially following it, and the ratio between the two tells me something about the resistance. If the resistance is low, then I get plenty of current, and if the resistance is high, I get less current because um, the resistance is essentially the sort of the um, resistance to the flow of electrons. Flow of electrons is current. So we can look at the um, a voltage applied, look at the current response, and we can tell you something, therefore, about the resistance. Um, and you can do that in a battery. You can do that in an electrochemical um, cell. Now, electrochemical systems are not just simple resistors. A simple resistor says, if I apply voltage, I will immediately get a current change. And if I alternate that voltage, the current is synchronously changing with it. But electrochemical systems, including batteries, fuel cells, solar cells, um, biosensors, they actually don't just act like resistors. They actually act also like capacitors. They have a slight tendency to be able to store charge. And this storage of charge means that as I change the voltage, yeah, the current changes, sure it does, but it's slightly delayed. There's a, I want to call it lag, but there's a phase shift. So the voltage changes and the current changes, but there's a delay between the two. And that's because of the capacitive nature also of electrochemical systems. So they don't act just like simple resistors. They more they act, for example, like as a resistor and a capacitor in parallel, as I've shown here. And this is, um, I'll just move myself slightly out of the way. 
this is um, the Randall circuit, which is one of the simplest models for an electrochemical system where I have a resistor in parallel with a capacitor and a resistor. Um, now, it's a horrible phrase, but when I was just discussing resistance a minute ago and I talked about Ohm's law, I then started to say, right, now I'm going to bring in the term impedance because impedance is really telling us that um, if it's just a simple relationship between current and voltage and these things are synchronous, it's resistance. But if there's an, um, a delay or a lag between the voltage and the current, then we've really got um, capacitance in it. And that, that lag is really kind of called the imaginary um, component. Um, so I don't like the term imaginary because it suggests it's imagined, but it's just a mathematical term. I mean, it comes from the um, square root of minus one. Um, so what is happening in impedance spectroscopy is we are applying a um, alternating potential and we are looking at the responding current, but they are not um, immediately proportional. They're proportional to one another, but there is a um, lag in the current, um, for example. Um, and this is kind of represented here that um, the potential here is being moved from minus um, one volts to one volts and the current is changing, but it's not just linear with it. There's a kind of, um, it's more like an oval, and this is called a Lisageur um, curve. Now, these are not used so much in um, impedance spectroscopy. They used to be used, but they are used much more in, el in um, electronics. Um, and I've seen these on oscilloscopes and wondered what they were, and now I realize these are Lisageur curves. And actually, in electrochemistry, we kind of, um, skip through this but it's actually the data that you get shown on a modern um, electrochemical impedance spectrometer that data has actually been through a lot of processing by the time you see it and one of the processes it could have been through is a kind of laser jour um, curve um, like this so this um, track that's going around um, that's really an impedance um, values these are all sort of impedance values and we can actually split those impedance values into what's called the real and imaginary. The real parts are in that equivalent circuit, what are my real, the real values are what are my resistances and the imaginary um, parts are what are my capacitors. And capacitors are interesting because um, they have a impedance that has a frequency, um, they're also f uh, sensitive to frequency. So as resistors, a true resistor is not sensitive to frequency. Um, capacitors are sensitive to frequency, and I'll come back to that um, in, a, in a bit. But now we're starting to introduce the, the frequency idea. So when you look at the, the, the name electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, the spectroscopy bit is really talking, um, is really reflecting the fact that there's a frequency um, uh, part to this whole sort of process. So let's go now into the maths of this. So we start off with E equal to IR. So E in this case is what we mean is potential. Um, in school you're sometimes told that V is equal to IR and that volts is equal to current times resistance. But voltage, strictly speaking, is or volts is the units. Um, it's potential is really the sort of name for it. So the potential is equal to I times R. That is um, Ohm's law. Um, now, in impedance spectroscopy, we recognize that um, impedance is more complex than just resistance. There's also this kind of um, component that's called the imaginary component. So we changed the sort of Z to reflect the fact that there's capacitance in this as well as resistance um, as well. Um, now, what we're doing in impedance spectroscopy is we're not just changing voltage. Um, in a sort of linear manner or um, stepping it, we're actually changing voltage in a sinusoidal fashion. So the, the um, I, say I use the word voltage there, the potential is going, um, it's actually up and down, but it's going doing this with time in a, um, in a sinusoidal fashion. And you can think of this really as a sort of circle um, that's rotating and it's important this rotation because in a bit, you're going to see that this rotation is really where this kind of frequency idea comes from. Because if I rotate slowly, that's one frequency. And if I rotate fast, that's another frequency. So frequency will be something that gets changed when doing an impedance spectroscopy um, experiment.
so um when we're talking about um the potential in in penis spectroscopy the potential changes with time and it changes as the sign of 2 pi ft 2 pi time to frequency times time um now i want to simplify that down a bit and i say when i i mean there are great you know electrochemists have come before any of us um and you know they've really helped us sort of you know determine the maths behind this but omega here is equal to 2 pi f and this is really the angular frequency so we're going to replace um in the sign bracket 2 pi f t we're going to just replace that with um omega t omega means um 2 pi um f and it really tells me how many radians we're sweeping per um per second um, and so we've just simplified that down. So it's really the same equation, but we've just replaced um, 2f with um, omega in this um, case. Now, we said earlier on that um, we are changing the potential or controlling it in a sinusoidal fashion. And the current is responding. Um, and in an electrochemical system, it's responding. So it's, you know, I at any time t is equal to I sine omega t plus a phase shift and that phase shift is the capacitance value at that particular um, frequency so this is the guy that sort of puts the offset between um, potential that's applied and current um, response um, if we just rearrange the idea that we're really trying to measure impedance then impedance is equal to potential over time um, those potentials are changing with the angular frequency um, and the current is changing the angular frequency and we still got that omega um, term in there as um, I shouldn't say omega I should say theta sorry that's theta that's the um, phase shift that's theta that's the phase shift omega is the um, angular frequency and I'm gonna have to pull myself I realize out of the um, picture here as I go on um, a little bit with this so what really what this equation is telling us about is about how um, current is changing with potential um, as the potential is being changed in this um, sinusoidal way. And I'm using this Lissajour animation here as well. But we're going to start simplifying this down a little bit now. Um, first of all, I'm not going to derive Euler's theorem. I think Euler's theorem came in about the 18th century, or oh, sorry, Euler's formula. But it's a way of saying, right, rather than saying impedance is equal to E over I sine um, omega T, I sine omega T plus theta, rather than writing like that, we can actually write it in a sort of exponent, exponentials like this. But actually that can even be simplified down to just say that Z is equal to a magnitude of Z um, exponential and I here, I, I, had, I know I haven't said it, and I've said I. We're using the symbol J because I means current in electrochemistry. So we're using J, but J means the square root of um, minus one. So it's sort of Z is equal to the magnitude of Z exponential square root of minus one or I. But we use J because we don't want to otherwise confuse um, times um, theta. Um, and that's really a kind of polar coordinate. It kind of says that, look, um, I can pretend that this is actually a line with a certain um, length, um, which is the Z, with an angle, theta. But in electrochemistry, we don't leave it in these kind of polar coordinates. We actually convert it um, often into an imaginary component and a real component. The imaginary component is that bit that has theta in it and tells us about the capacitance. And the parts of the signal that are not frequency dependent are the real component. Um, it tells us about the resistances. So we can we can think of um, Z E J theta or Z exponential J theta really as having a real part and an imaginary part. Um, the kind of what we do is we're converting this to an argon diagram into the Cartesian complex plane, and actually then coming down to say that Z is equal to Z prime, which is the real times. Um, J Z double prime, which is the imaginary component that J means um, the square root of minus one. Typically in mathematics, you would actually call that um, I, but it confuses in electrochemistry because I also means current. So what are we saying here? What we're saying here is at its simplest way of understanding impedance spectroscopy, 
you just need to understand Ohm's law. But what it says is so, you know, so in Ohm's law, potential is equal to I times R, and therefore resistance is equal to potential over I. Um, but we're just saying, look, in electrochemistry, because electrochemical cells have capacitance as well, you have you end up having to consider the resistance of um, capacitors, and we start to call that the kind of imaginary component. And so all this maths is really just to say to you, in the end, that um, Z is equal to a real component plus an imaginary component. And then in electrochemistry, we often um, display this real and imaginary components, and I will be doing that um, shortly. So I'm going to bring come back to frequency just really quickly. Um, and the reason I'm going to come back to frequency is because I want to bring back the, the idea of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And the spectroscopy really refers to um, frequency. Frequency is really useful because we're saying to you, this is a nice model for an electrochemical cell, whether you're working in batteries, fuel cells, solar cells, biosensors, this is a model for that system. And that models, in the simplest case, we could call it a Randall circuit. It pretends that you have a solution resistance, a charge transfer resistance, and a double A capacitance. Solution resistance is what is the resistance if it's a lithium ion battery of my electrolyte. The charge transfer resistance is how easy is it for electrons to get from that anode into the external cell. And the double A capacitance says how good is um, my electrode for temporarily storing that charge. Um, so we have solution capacitance and double layer capacitance. And what it says is by changing frequency, I can interrogate different elements in this model. So if we use one hertz, and it's not unusual to sort of, you know, to do an experiment in, I mean, if I'm doing, you know, I'm talking about an impedance spectrometer in that video there, to do an experiment from like one hertz to 100 um, kilohertz. Obviously, people want to go up to sometimes one megahertz, depending on the application, depends how high frequency you go. But let's say, you know, I do my first, I'm doing a piece of spectroscopy. I'm going to scan from one hertz up to some higher hertz. But I start at one hertz. At one hertz, the capacitor is acting like a really high resistive or high impedance element. So the current actually flows through the solution and it flows through the charge transfer resistor but it does not go through the capacitor. Um, if I use a really high frequency, the current actually flows through the solution, resi solution resistance because it has no choice. There's only one path. And then it has a choice. Do I go through the charge transfer resistance or I do, do I go through the double A capacitance? At high frequency, capacitors have low impedance. So it actually goes through the um, capacitor. And then there's an intermediate, let's say one kilohertz, which says, which path do I go through? And it says, well, actually, I go through both paths because they're actually fairly balanced. So there's a property of capacitors which resistors don't have, and that property of capacitors is they show lower uh, impedance the higher the frequency. And that's why um, we can so essentially interrogate our electrochemical cell, and we can use these types of models to say, oh, well, look how the properties or the elements in that circuit are changing with frequency and you can start to understand the system that you're actually um you're trying to characterize it for example so how do we sort of essentially display our um data so what we would do is we would do an impedance spectrum um, an impedance um, experiment electrochemical impedance spectrum or um, spectroscopy on this so we would have our um, electrochemical cell we would interrogate it at um, high frequency and we would get a real and imaginary value because we're at high frequency the capacitor actually has a low impedance and therefore we get a essentially a, um, not very high on the imaginary axis but you know we get a real you know resistance value and then as we um, sorry decrease the um, frequency the um, influence of that capacitor um, starts to actually um, impact and um, in a sort of point at one point it sort of reaches a sort of maximum and then actually we come back to the um, 
to the real axis again. I have simplified this, but this is kind of a, what's called a Nyquist um, plot. But what's nice about this is that we can actually then say, all right, if you ask us the question, what was the solution resistance in that experiment? Looking at the Nyquist plot, plot literally where this um, circle is intercepting the real axis here, that would tell us what our solution resistance is. You can ask us a question, what's that charge transfer, res charge transfer resistance? Um, and by looking at the um, circumference of that semicircle, I could tell you what the charge transfer resistance is. You could ask us, well, what was the sort of double layer capacitance of that electrode like? And by looking at the sort of maximum here, we could tell you what the impedance of that um, capacitor was like. So what does this say? It says, I could be interrogating a biosensor, or I could be interrogating a lithium ion battery or a photovoltaic cell. But if I do this type of experiment, I will be able to start to tell you what the resistance of my solution was, what my charge transfer resistance was, what my double layer capacitance was. And you can either be optimizing these materials or they can actually be part of your signal. It depends on the application. So um, in the world of batteries, you would want to get solution resistance you know, down. Um, in the world of biosensing, solution resistance is, is what it is often but we want to get it out of our signal because we really are signals in the charge transfer resistance. So um, you can use it, as I say, for characterizing and optimizing, or you can use it for removing artifacts from your signal to leave you with your true signal. Um, and the Nyquist plot is not the only way of displaying this. And um, we often look at the Bode plot as well, where we would look at the log of impedance versus the log of frequency. Um, and these kind of often sort of show a plateau with a sort of, um, with a, sort of shift and then it will come to a sort of new um, baseline or we can also look at the phase um, angle as a function of frequency as well and this kind of comes up reaches some sort of maximum and then um, comes back down again so there's lots of ways of looking at impedance data and in electrochemistry we tend towards Nyquist and Bode plots um, it's fair to say in the electronics industry they're much more used to looking at the Les Azure curves um, but you know, depending on who you are and your background, you know, they all work um, equally as well. Now, generating an equivalent circuit, I mean, this seems like a bit of a black art, but actually um, it's not so bad these days. I mean, at least at ZP, what we've done is we have a data, um, a data management system called Julie. It's a cloud system that re obviously resides on the servers. You can open up an account with Julie. And what it does is, if you do some impedance spectroscopy experiments, and this is Syndra here explaining it, it'll actually look at your raw data. It will compare it with the literature, and it will actually give you a, um, a suggestion for your um, equivalent circuit. So I think it's hard for people to get into impedance spectroscopy. <coughs> One of the first things they might have to do is actually come up with an equivalent circuit. Well, this actually helps them accelerate that effort because it will actually... Um, suggest equivalent circuits and I can see here that um, what Syndra is doing is having got Julie to give him an equivalent circuit it then actually gives him a, um, a reference and then he's able to look at that reference it's given him a DOI number which is a unique identifier for the paper and then he's gone off to read um, the paper itself so Julie's a great way of actually helping you on your route to coming up for Garmsel an equivalent circuit. Um, so I hope this introduction to impedance spectroscopy has been useful. What's really becoming powerful about impedance spectroscopy is that actually, you know, impedance spectrometers used to be um, an example in this video here where, you know, something, even though this one's quite small, it's quite elegant, it has five channels. You know, it was something that's kind of lab based, whereas actually impedance spectrometers now can be as small as the tip of your finger. So they will really find their way into many more applications, um, wearable biosensors, for example. Um, they'll be in the battery packs or in the battery modules in cars doing state of health, state of charge, um, remaining useful life type measurements. Um, and of course, with things like Julie um, these days, the gap between getting data and understanding data through models is actually um, accelerated. So if you've got any technical questions for ZP regarding electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, um, please don't hesitate to um, reach out to us. Okay, thanks very much.